I'm really excited to talk to Kathy O'Neill today. She is a data scientist and mathematician, the author of the best-selling book, Weapons of Math Destruction, How Big Data Increases Inequality and Threatens Democracy. And her latest book is The Shame Machine, Who Profits in the Age of Humiliation? She's also and also visiting scholar with the University of Virginia um, School of Data Science. Kathy, thank you so much for uh, joining Wider Angle. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's my pleasure. Great. So let's dive in. In the introduction of your book, you acknowledge your own experiences of body shame. Uh, and later in the book, you describe uh, the process before and after bariatric surgery. You also recognize that many others have written about psychology of shame uh, before you. But you do clarify from the start that you focus on how shame, quote unquote, is manufactured and mined. What do you mean by that? And how did you come to research shame and its place in our lives? Well, um, one of the ways I came about it, it's really, it sort of, it was, let me say it this way. There were two different tracks that were very, very separate. And I noticed that the unifying theme was shame and that it was a, a unifying theme in the sense of having um, a kind of pre-rational power over people um so that's let me just tell you the two the two tracks so the first one was when i was uh, in, in doing background research for my first book weapons of math destruction the teachers i interviewed who were being fired based on an algorithm that no one could explain to them and which by the way ended up being almost a random number generator so it's an arbitrary thing um outrageous that it was being used for such high stakes decisions um when you know, it was, well, I was outraged even at the time because I thought it was outrageous that they weren't being provided an explanation for exactly what their score meant and and uh, and why they had, had scored badly. You know, this is before I even knew that it was almost a information free score. I thought there was information in it, but I at the very least thought they, they should know what those, that information was. And I would ask teachers and principals for that matter, um, you know, what you know, did you ask for an explanation about your score? And they would just come back to me saying, oh, well, I did ask, but they told me it was math and I wouldn't understand it. And, you know, as a mathematician myself, I was just blown away by this. Um, first of all, that somebody would say that um, it was clear act of math shaming, um, but also that it was so successful, um, you know, because I guess having a PhD in math makes it hard for me to be math shamed. I was, I would have just laughed if someone had said that I would have said, oh, no, no. Like, if you can't explain it, that's your problem, not mine. You know, like, in other words, I would have known it was a gimmick, if you will, it, but it was so potent that gimmick makes it sound like it wasn't powerful, whereas it was extremely powerful. And in particular, what I noticed was even though these civil servants had every right to know why they were being fired, um, they they ceded their rights in the face of shame. They ceded their rights. And I remember taking note of that, being like, wow, like shame made them give up their rights on the spot. You know, they just they just didn't know what to say because they had been made to feel ashamed of themselves. And I was like, that is super potent. And I kind of put it in my back pocket, I mean, kind of, to be honest, feeling a little bit proud of myself that I wasn't vulnerable to such such a, a a tactic um but then i was doing research um on bariatric surgery a few years later um after my brother had been diagnosed with diabetes my dad had diabetes uh he died of diabetes complications and it was awful really awful growing up with a dad who's you know whose blood sugar so simply was never never under control and um i learned that you could really help you know, control and tame diabetes with bariatric surgery. So I was like looking into it. But as soon as you look into bariatric surgery, because it's considered a weight loss surgery, um, you are just completely inundated if you're doing online research like I was with fat shaming um, tactics. And I'll tell you what, I felt like hiding. I felt like ceding my right to be healthy. I felt like buying those, buying into those terrible um ineffective fad diets or body sculpting you know there was just so much 
And, you know, I kept on trying to do this research and kept on being completely um, stymied by, by the, um, by the shame. And then I was like, oh, wait, I recognize this. This is what I saw ha happen to those teachers. You know, the same, same reaction basically, which is I will do literally anything to make this stop because I feel so, I feel so unlovable right now. And I feel so worthless. And that is what shame is. And I will just say that both of those examples, the teachers being shamed um, and my experience of online uh, research around weight loss surgery, which I still maintain should be called diabetes um, uh, surgery. Um, but there's a reason it isn't because there, there's, there's money to be made um, or there's power to be held in the case of the teachers. The teachers were being, um, basically the teachers were being pummeled with politics at, you know, that through that, through that system, it was basically like a, a tool to wield against the teachers union. It was, they were pawns in a larger political game. Um, and it really had nothing to do with what, whether they were a good teacher or not, you know what I mean? And so like the shame was a methodology, a tactic, a successful tactic to keep them quiet um, and to, to be able to use them as pawns. Whereas for me, the shame was a tactic, a manipulation to get me to spend money on useless things that would fail, but that I would blame myself for their failures rather than complain that I had been duped. So there's uh, what I when I put these two things together, I recognize not only the power of shame, the potency of that <clears throat> of that manipulation, but also like, wait, there's so much to be gained if you can shame people. There's so much money to be made. There's so much power to be kept, and shame um, shame has has all of that and more. Um, and the more I more I read into it, the more I learned learned about it. Yeah, one super powerful sentence that stuck with me is when you said, uh, when you write in the book, I quote, the shamescape in, in constant flux, but always brimming with opportunity, um, end of quote. So, I mean, you are based in the United States, yeah. but you also call this shame as a global force in this sense. So I'm curious, um, is this the industrial shame complex as a little bit that you just addressed now in terms of the sectors of economy? Um, several that you describe in the book that exploit everyone regardless of where they are i mean i just want to make it clear that like shame is a very very important evolutionary tool if you mm -hmm. will and when i say evolutionary i mean uh to for the preservation of groups of people living together and mm -hmm. not not like killing each other mm -hmm. shame is extremely valuable mm -hmm. and it is extremely valuable that we care about shame as much as we do um and when I say we care about it, when we are uh, made to feel ashamed, it, it, ashamed, it's it's similar to the feeling in our brain of being punched. I mean, it is it's a similar kind of pain that physical pain gives us, but it actually lasts longer. And so it's like a very strong memory, and we probably all have memories of being ashamed and being made to feel ashamed by a family and friends as children. And that's important because they were lessons that we had to learn. So I just want to clarify that I'm not saying shame is bad. That's way mm -hmm. too simple. Shame is actually not bad. It's extremely important. And it's sometimes actually very, very good. Um, we'll probably get to that. But I, but the, from an evolutionary point of view, I want people to think of shame as is the thing that makes us do stuff that we personally don't really want to do, but it is important for the community that we do it. So for example, if we are in a uh, time of food scarcity, we probably want to hoard food, but that's not what we're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And if we are found to be hoarding food in a time of scarcity, we will be shunned by our group, right? And we will in fact be, a sh be shamed and possibly even thrown out. Um, so the threat of expulsion um, from our, you know, critical family unit is it the threat is important and it forces us to behave so i just want to say that like of course it's global because we're all humans and we all have that need for connection and love and being belonging because we have a need to be safe and to be fed and to be housed and all those things are community oriented things um having said that like the question of whether this particular form of exploitative, profit-driven shame uh, is universal. 
Um, I don't know. I haven't lived everywhere. I do know that. I do know that shame is everywhere in every society, um, and po possibly for very, very good reasons. I also know that you know. I remember reading an article about how um, I think it was a, a a razor company or maybe a a, a skin a skin um, lotion company um, wanted to sell razors or uh, basically wanted to get Japanese women to shave their legs. But when they did a survey, they didn't that they found that Japanese women didn't have any problem with their leg hair. This is many, many decades ago. And so they set about like forming shame about body hair. Uh, that's the sort of like they prepped, if you will, they prepped with shame and then they sold the product to solve that shaming problem, the shameful problem. And I think that is like the model I want people to keep in mind when I talk about profit driven shame you know machines or the shamescape like we we are not inherently ashamed of ourselves we are taught to be ashamed of ourselves by the way people react to us or the way we were socialized um whether that is by instagram photos of you know fabulously wealthy beautiful and sculpted um models or how our parents talk to us when we're children you know i mean we are socialized to feel very very vulnerable and and possibly ashamed of ourselves in various ways but that is exploitable and exploited at a at a, a at scale by companies that want to sell us things especially products that are supposed to like solve the problems mm -hmm. that we're supposed to be ashamed of so whether that's skin cream for wrinkles of course that's a very old one um or you know more recent ones like um you'll see prevagen being sold to older people the idea that there is, oh, you're you're getting senile, you're forgetting things. This is going to help you with your memory. Aren't you ashamed of yourself? Like you should solve your terrible, shameful problem mm -hmm. by buying this stuff that doesn't do anything. There's no reason to think it works at all, but it's a many billion dollar a year company because people really are ashamed of getting older. Because why? Because we we are we shame older people. We you know we we are ashamed of age and aging. So it's that kind of thing that I'm referring to which is of course global, but I don't, I'm not sure that it's the same. It doesn't represent, yeah. it doesn't manifest the same in every country, of course. Yeah. Um, and we'll get to that part of cultural nuances that you mentioned a, a little bit as well. So when you speak of these shame industries, you do emphasize the idea of choice. And yeah. so it would be really important that you elaborate on that concept uh, for our audience within this idea of industrial shame complex. Right. And, and, and by the way, I should say that this book was a product of me trying to understand when is shame appropriate, when is shame inappropriate. I, um, I recognized that the kind of bullying shame that I had felt um, at the, you know, by the fat shaming ads and the teachers, I definitely considered those in irresponsible and bullying shaming instances, but I didn't know exactly what about them made them um, so, so bad. Mm -hmm. And I'd also been an activist in Occupy fine and Occupy Wall Street. And mm -hmm. I was like, no, we should shame the bankers. Mm -hmm. You know, like we should shame the people in power to like do better. They we deserve better, you know, like so I and I, I'm like, well, what why do I think that's okay? Mm -hmm. And so one of the well, I came up with two kind of basic questions that I think are very helpful. They're they're not perfect a perfect description of this question of inappropriate versus appropriate shame, but I think they, they're pretty good. Um, there's certainly questions you should ask yourself when you're tempted to shame, or you should ask yourself when you're being shamed, which is, does this person actually have choice about their shameful behavior? And I, I'll, I'll, I'll back up one, even more, one more step, which is the point of shame is to try that, you know, theoretical point of shame is to get somebody to conform to a norm, mm -hmm. to, to behave better, if you will. Mm -hmm. So like uh, shame on you for hoarding food. So like the norm is hoarding food. And like, so the question is, do you have the choice to behave mm -hmm. better mm -hmm. um, with hoarding food? It sounds like probably you did, you know, you could have told people, Hey, I've got food. We can share it. Um, but then it, what about aging? Do we have a choice mm -hmm. to not age? I don't think so. No. Mm -hmm. Do we have a choice to not be fat? That's a, a question that, um, you know, I spent a lot of time on in the book. I was pleased today, by the way, to see in the New York Times an article about um, that gets exactly to the point I got to mm -hmm. uh, after a huge amount of research that said 
actually doctors have no idea why obesity is so prevalent. They just, there's no explanation. We know why it isn't. It's not willpower. It's not that people haven't tried dieting. Mm -hmm. Dieting is a big industry. It doesn't actually solve the obesity uh, problem for the, even for the people who pay a lot of money for it. So the point being that we actually, we are all sort of kind of um, brainwashed, I would say, into thinking that that fatness is a choice. Um, and for that reason, we feel that it is appropriate to shame somebody based on making the wrong choice. Similarly, we have been convinced, I'm not, I'm not to say we all are convinced, but I would say like the, the general public is convinced that beauty is a choice. Like, mm -hmm. why aren't you more beautiful? Here are the things you need to pay for to, you know, whatever it's goop wellness, uh, you know, uh, or body sculpting or going to the gym more, whatever it is, like, here are the things you're, you're choosing to do. You know, you're, you have a choice, you're making the wrong choice. Here's an expensive thing, um, to help you make the right choice and be beautiful and be young and be whatever, be skinny as if those things are actually choices. Um, so that's the, that's the thing about choice. And, and of course, I, I don't want to, mm -hmm. I don't want to dismiss the fact that choice is a, a, a sort of, <laughs> I'm not against free will, you know, like choice is a big part of it, being a human. And I would even say that we have some amount of choice over our weight. Like people really can change their beer drinking behavior and lose a few pounds, maybe five pounds, maybe 10 pounds even. But what the mistake people make is, is to think that if you can lose five or 10 pounds, if you do 10 of those things, you can lose a hundred pounds. Mm -hmm. 50 to 100 pounds. That's actually not true. That's not backed up. Um, not not for a long term anyway. You can do that for a very short amount of time, but your body basically goes into starvation mode and then compensates. So the, the larger point is that we have some amount of choice, but not as much choice as we would want to have. <laughs> I think it's a really hard message, honestly. People really want to think, oh, I'm a little bit heavy now, but I have the choice to lose this weight. They also want to think, oh, the people who are way heavier than me, they really screwed up. Why do, why do we want to do that? I, my theory is that we want to distance ourselves from people that are like less lucky than us. Um, and we want to say they're making a choice and it's the wrong choice. Not unlike me, I'm making the right choice. So it's a way of sort of psychologically distancing ourselves from, from those people. And I would, I would, you know, um, I would uh, generalize that. I have chapters on, you know, the notion of addiction to drugs being mm -hmm. a choice. So the way we, the way we shame people who are with addictions, um, you know, I think the kind of um, iconic explanation of where that came from, that this is a choice, is the Nancy Reagan just say no campaign, right? Mm -hmm. But as if like people with serious long long term addiction problems are simply refusing to say no no like addiction addiction changes your brain and you can get addicted you know and i i profiled somebody who got addicted based on a doctor's prescription and it's very very as a teenager um so it's like the idea that that people or for that matter people who are poor have a choice they made the wrong choice they're they're like they're lazy blah 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 these are all um choices that choices we've made as a society to shame people um, for terrible ills um, that have befallen them, addiction problems, health problems, aging, you know, um, poverty. We, we've we decided, you know, these people, the those people, I should say, you know, like we, we framed it as like those people because it's easier for us. It makes us feel like it's less likely to happen to us or to our children because our, we're smart. And we're going to make those right choices. So, so I, it's a long, answer to a short question, but I think the nature of choice and the nature of how we project choice onto other people allows us to get that kind of like blaming, shaming um, distance from people. And so we can say, oh, the things that are happening to you are not my problem, not mm -hmm. my, you know, not my responsibility to help you solve. They are in fact a, a product of your poor choices. Mm -hmm. And that that is inherently kind of dismissive and, and shaming. Mm -hmm. So speaking of money making opportunities in this context, we have different conversations about the role of seemingly ever growing unchecked power of digital 
companies and uh, giants have been going on for a while now. And it's uh, yeah. very serendipitous that we're having this conversation while Twitter supposedly oh is falling apart or not falling apart. I don't know so what's going yeah. to happen, but there's a, a, a huge change. And yeah. so um, we've had and heard conversations about the impact on democracies, polarization around the world, privacy. So I'm curious you about your opinion on, I mean, obviously you've studied this for, for in previous book and even now, um, about what these what you call powerful new shame machines and the network shame. Yeah, yeah. What is your opinion about obviously the role of tech companies? Um, and you can chip in chime in with the opinion about Twitter, what's been happening now. Um, yeah. I'm kind of glued to the news about Twitter, even though I ever changing. <laughs> yeah. I, I quit Twitter like in a huff. Yeah. When uh, when the day Elon Musk announced he was going to buy it, all I saw on my feed, which I really curated very carefully over years, uh -huh. but yet there I was. It was Johnny Depp trial, and oh. uh, and I was like, I can do. Better. I'm not doing this. Yeah. yeah. Um. Yeah. So I want to. I, I yeah. I want to give credit to to the big tech social media companies for changing the way they that the shame machine works. Um, they're innovative in the following sense. Mm. They move from that old model, which mm. I just described, like shame someone for having wrinkles and sell them wrinkle cream. Shame mm. somebody for having a smelly vagina and then sell them vagina mm -hmm. um, freshener that actually gives you yeast infections, which is another product they sell, um, which I also talk about in my book. Mm -hmm. um, that is a kind of, let me just reframe it as like, I directly shame you and then I directly sell you a product right? That's not what's happening at the level of social media. It's different, but there still is a prep period and then a profit period, but it's just done differently. So the way that I think about social media working is you prep people for shaming by designing the social media platforms themselves as places where you become extremely self-conscious, um, extremely, um, you know, performatively, um, uh, performing, I should say, you, you you become performative in your sort of, this is my glamorous life. This is my glamorous meal. Um, this is, you know, my, I'm, I'm always happy. Here's always good news about my family. Like you're just performing all the time. So you're getting in this kind of more and more, and it's by design, it's designed that way. You're getting in a more and more performative state and it's a self-conscious state. So that's the prep. And then the profit is where, well, okay, let's get all these people who are performing um, virtue to like hate each other. So mm -hmm. let's um, elevate the most outrageous offensive thing that someone near your social group, but not in your social group did. So you can like be outraged by it. You can perform your outrage. Everybody around you can agree with you that that was outrageous. And then those people can feel like outraged about your outrage, you know? So it's, it's this, like, I would call it shame cycles um, that keep us on those, our platforms, our social media platforms, which of course is all they really want. Well, what they want is just to stay there forever because the longer we stay there, the more profit they make in terms of ad money. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is like, instead of directly shaming us, they're getting us to shame each other. Instead of selling us a product to alleviate our shame, they're keeping us outraged and, and shaming and ashamed because the longer we stay up there, the longer we care, the longer we care to be self-conscious and, and to try to um, uh, try to get our, our reputation back to where it used to be, um, mm -hmm. the more money they make. It's really pretty, uh, pretty interesting the way they've done it. Mm -hmm. It is also deeply, deeply problematic. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, I will add that the old school version, the old school like shame industrial complex of directly shaming us is also absolutely in effect on social media. Why? Because we have the advertisement model, which which um, is even more pinpointed and micro targeted to, you know, to to send young women to, um, you know, diet sites or mm -hmm. even um, anorexia sites. So there's there's like absolutely the old model still happening in the form of adver an advertising dollar. So you still have that shaming and here's a product that you can buy to make your shame go away. But on top of that, there's the sort of general, like, we're just going to make you all hate each other um, and, mm -hmm. and, and shame and outrage. And that will make us money too. 
And for those of us who might have even been aware of that part of how the digital companies are exploiting that um, rage or the potential for rage, I was fascinating by learning about the data economy and that part, which I had not thought about consciously. So can you tell us a little bit about that part of shame living in the data economy? Because many might not be aware of the depths of this. Yeah, and it's it's a feedback loop between the people that collect and sell data and the um, mm-hmm. systems that use data. So there's um, there's an enormous industry mm-hmm. of repurposed data, um, and it's led by the the biggest company in the industry called Axiom. They they have they basically files on everyone, and they 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 score us in hundreds of ways. Um, so just as an example, they score us for the, our propensity to gamble. Right. So they're going to know, are we likely to be turned on by um, an advertisement from Caesar's Palace for free night stay if as long as we stay at least, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, so gambling, they sort of basically they, they have a list of gambling addicts, um, but they also have scored everyone for the, the propensity to gamble. Maybe mm-hmm. it's sports gambling now online. I don't know what it is. They will have it. Why will they have it? Because that's what advertisers are looking for when they're um, deciding who to show. Um, so they're going to actually buy a list of people, a list of identities of people who have this propensity in order to directly advertise to them on social media. And that's how that's how the 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 ad ecosystem works. It's not, of course, it's not uh, relegated only to gambling. It's kind of like anything that you can imagine. Um, people who are sensitive to their weight, people who, you know, of course, they won't be say, said it that way. It'll mm-hmm. probably be described as like people who are body conscious or, you know, people who are fitness conscious. Um, so that, but you'll have these kind of slightly coded, not very coded descriptions that that the companies advertising their products will sort of absolutely seize on and then. And then a, a company like Facebook will also be able to do something called lookalike audiences. So you might have paid for a list of 20,000 people who who are known to buy beauty products. Um, but then, the, then you'll ask Facebook, please show this to these 20,000, but also people like them. And so Facebook has their own um, way of scoring people. It's even more minute and accurate than the Axiom because they have much more behavior information. And so they'll be able to sort of double down on that approach of giving like exactly the people that are most vulnerable to that um that that message now i should say like this is i'm describing something that a lot of people in the ad tech system would would say hey that's good you know that you're Mm -hmm. describing how efficient we are Mm -hmm. um and in some sense that's true like i personally love yarn (laughs) i love like cashmere yarn i'm a knitter and i get really good advertisements for oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> me out, you know um so it's not always that bad you know it's kind of like i should probably not buy as much urine as i do and that you know but it's not inherently evil mm-hmm. um but the, but the last thing i'll say about it, this ecosystem is that um it's not inherently evil but it is optimized to attention just like facebook or, or instagram or tiktok they um it's you could even call it addiction it's optimized to keeping us plastered to the social media and what keeps us plastered to the social media is shame is being self-conscious being feeling like i need to do better than this so so there is so even though not everything is evil um the things that make the most money typically are pretty evil Um, Another big conversation that's been going on for several years now um, in the United States and exported around the world is the conversation about cancel culture. And you do acknowledge both the rapid growth in your book and you uh, compare it kind of to religious shunning. But I'm curious to hear, and I am aware that this is one of the among the most sensitive cultural topics in the U.S. um, And we have audiences from around the world. your opinion about what you say, how, I mean, it can come from the best intention, but on the other hand, it can become something totally different. And mm. I'm curious to your opinion, because I thought that the idea and concepts of dignity violation yeah. was very pertinent. If we were all to abide by that, it would have been great. But again, <laughs> a lot of cancel culture happens on Twitter um, yeah. and elsewhere, which um, is 
all about rage. So what are your thoughts about um, that? Well, uh, yeah, that's a great question. And I, I will just back up a little bit and say, uh, I only mentioned one of the two things that I think about when I decide whether shame is appropriate. I mentioned the notion of choice. So my feeling is, you know, if that person really has a choice, then maybe shame is appropriate. Mm -hmm. But there's another aspect to it, which is what I call voice. Do they have a voice? Can they defend themselves? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, someone in power typically can someone who's powerless typically can't the exception might be within families mm -hmm. you know you don't have to have formal power to be able to defend yourself in the family but if you are a child in a family with dominating parents who are shaming you then you don't have power mm -hmm. um so you don't have voice so i i want to i want to make the claim and just bear with me that um mm -hmm. shame can never be appropriate unless the person who is the target has voice and choice um so they are someone who could have just decided to behave in a different way and they have a way of defending what they've done um so they're not like they're not going to be just miss like falsely accused if you will of bad behavior and then then their life is over um the problem with social media is is that notion of def defending oneself it's really difficult to defend oneself uh, in in large part because of the way things are, mistakes are amplified, but corrections aren't. So you um, could you could imagine someone being accused falsely of of some egregious behavior, um, it becoming viral, everybody hating them, they get canceled, and then when it's uh, like when subtlety is added to the context, that doesn't go viral. That's never going to go viral, um, and. And it's because it doesn't attract as much engagement slash addiction slash advertising dollars. So it's a it's a it's a purely profit driven issue um, of the design of the system. But the 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 larger point is that I for the for the very reason I just described, I almost always think that um, piloting on in a social media context is punching down, which I call inappropriate uh, shaming. So I call it punching down mm -hmm. if the person is denied either choice or voice. Um, even if it's an egregious behavior, they had, they, they should know better. Um, I typically am like, I, I can't hear this person's side of the story. I'm not going to pile on to this. Now there are exceptions. Like if the person is in fact very powerful and has a microphone, um, uh, and, you know, and, and they can, only, they can amplify their defense. So if you think of people like um, Donald Trump or mm -hmm. Kanye West or or Elon Musk. I mean, they're people that when they're being when they make mistakes and people call them out on it, um, mm -hmm. they can complain about being canceled, but they're not being canceled. They get to they get mm -hmm. to de defend themselves, and th that leads me to my last point about cancel culture, which is that when I think about canceled lives, I really almost always go back to the um, my childhood memories of all the kids in you know, in the crack epidemic who were imprisoned for the rest of their lives um, and never heard from again in, in the black neighborhoods of Dorchester and Roxbury and Boston. That was cancellation, you know? Um, what we what we call cancellation now, it, or what we hear from, when, especially when we hear from people complaining about being canceled, the, the very fact that we're hearing from them to complain about being canceled means that they have voice. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and typically they're, they're complaining that they're unfairly canceled, but they typically did something pretty egregious. Mm -hmm. um, so it's ironic to me that the very people who complain about cancel culture are the ones with voice and, and mostly choice. The people who we don't hear from are the victims of cancel culture. They don't have the voice to complain. Mm -hmm. So I, it's, so I guess my conclusion is, not that we don't have cancel culture that we should we should atone for it's that we are listening to the wrong people complain about it hmm. and that's the part where healthy shame as you call it um could come in uh, ideally and you argued that that is the should be the point of shaming the powerful or punching up and punching down right yes. um so exactly punching up would look like holding power to put uh, to account which mm. is to say Holding, uh, shaming someone uh, to behave better, who mm. is in power, who has the right to defend themselves and has the opportunity to be seen doing better. Like this mm. chance to be redeemed, I think is a crucial element of punching up. Like, listen, I want you to do better. I want you to 
follow through on your campaign promises, politician. Mm -hmm. um, and we're sitting here and we're waiting for 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 you to do better. We're and we're going to congratulate you if you do better. You know, mm -hmm. like you're not. It's not the end of the story. Your story continues. I guess the thing is, punching down is like your story doesn't continue. You're you've already screwed up and we'll never hear from you again. We'll never know whether you felt bad or whether you wanted to do better because you're just not important enough for us to keep track of. That's punching down. Punching up is, um, yes, we're, we're keeping our eyes on you and we're hoping and expecting better. The only thing that made me feel fearsome, I mean, fe afraid of that working even in the United States um, is the fact that, as you say, that works only when shamed and the shamers accept the sa same set of norms. And from yeah. reading the news, it seems that unfortunately, even in the United States, there are a lot of people who would argue that even these norms about yeah. democracy are not lo no longer agreed upon among That's right. different parties, right? And it's a crucial point. It's really crucial. Um, democracy is a very, very big, important norm that we don't all seem to agree on as much as we thought we did. Um, although I was somewhat happily surprised at the last election that people didn't actually want to vote as much for election deniers. That's a good sign. Um, so, but you're right that shame will absolutely inevitably fail if you're trying to shame somebody based on a norm they do not share mm. so it's even worse than that by the way not only will this shame fail because they don't agree with the rule but they will be offended the thing about mm. trying to shame somebody is it does land like a punch even if it doesn't work so what you're doing is you're punching somebody who who doesn't even agree with the rule that you're trying to enforce mm -hmm. it's kind of like you know, if you, you could imagine being told like you have to wear a dress that covers your knees, how dare you? And you just be like, what are you even saying right now? Like if you'd be so offended, right? It's an old fashioned norm. I don't agree with that norm anymore. How dare you tell me how to live my life? Mm -hmm. you're, it's like, not only are you not going to convince me to dress the way you're telling me to, but you're going to upset me and offend me. That's the point that uh, that you're pointing out, which is critically important. The, and, and it's another aspect of our social media environment, which is that our norms are changing very quickly, but also not universally. So it's not that we, you know, no. we all now realize that women are should be allowed to work, which is kind of a thing that has happened in the last hundred years, or that women should be able to own property. You know, there are these big universal norms that have changed in the U.S., but then there's more recently an enormous amount of bifurcation on norms that have changed locally for small groups. I like to give the example of like the pronouns, like some, you know, some groups are adamantly, you know, like these are, you should always be very sensitive to people's pronouns and, you know, binary fluid, blah, 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 gender fluid. And by the way, those are my friends. I love those people. I'm in that group, but I have to acknowledge that there's a lot of the country that just is not in that conversation, is not aware of those rules, doesn't see them, the gender thing or the pronoun thing as a rule that they have to follow. Mm -hmm. And when they don't follow the rules in, mm -hmm. in interacting with the people that have assumed that these norms have changed, um, it is not good because they don't even, because they get, a, they get shamed, they get targeted by shame and they're just like, what are you doing? And now I'm offended. And so we lost the opportunity to persuade and we're, we're at war. Mm. And so I think social media can be blamed for that too, because social media gives us the impression that we're in agreement, that we, that mm. we all have made progress. But when, what, when we ask, what does we mean? You realize that you're talking about a pretty small corner of a pretty small platform like Twitter. And you're just like, oh, I mean like these 3 million people. Well, 3 million people is 1% of the United States. Mm -hmm. It's just not that big. Mm -hmm. So even if we think we've made progress and we've like come to a better understanding, that doesn't mean it's a universally held belief or, or, or norm. So when we start shaming people based on that norm, it's going to backfire, not just fail, backfire. Yeah, that's so fascinating and interesting. I mean, the fact that, yes, we you mentioned in the book that the 
purpose of shame is kind of conformity, shaping somebody's yes. behavior. You also acknowledge in the book, and we just said it now, that the norms aren't universal. And to me, it seems so important to notice that. Uh, for example, I'm curious to hear your opinion. I just recently interviewed Batia Mesquita, who is a social psychologist and the author of the book, Between Us, How Cultures Create Emotions. So basically, uh, and she... And other um, scientists, social scientists like Owen Flanagan from Duke University talk about the moral, the importance of moral system in place in a particular community that impacts the norms and thus even the idea of shame. Because um, while I was reading about healthy shame opportunities in the United States, I kept thinking about what, for example, Batya Mesquita was talking about saying how shame, showing shame is a virtue rather yeah. than a sign of weakness in some societies as well. So mm -hmm. the question that came to my mind while I was kind of thinking about all this and reading your book after her interview is what, what do you think about that? I mean, if that is the case, if that such research suggests that if you're operating in a moral system where shaming kids like in Taiwanese culture, or even in some parts of the Middle East, North Africa, in Turkey, there is a whole like humongous word and concept ayup and where like they sh you know it's about forming the citizen based on that moral world out there so what do you think about about that idea those ideas yeah the, i mean it's absolutely critically important i mean to be clear that goes back to my original sort of evolutionarily evolutionary dis understanding of shame it is important to um to experience and to um, illustrate, you know, to expose the, your ability uh, to be ashamed. Like you're saying, I'm, yes, I'm so sorry. I I told you I would do this and I didn't do this and it makes me feel bad and I'm, I'm sorry. The, uh, it's critically important to be, uh, to be a good citizen it would, in whatever, whatever society you're talking about. Of course, <clears throat> the U.S., you know, has a different, culture of the individuality versus the group mm -hmm. um so we're, we're going to be less apologetic about our our mm -hmm. choices mm -hmm. um and that's part of our culture but the, but only to some limit you know if we're not proud of ourselves for for abandoning our children you know like there there are things that we do not do um because we would be unbelievably ashamed of ourselves if we did it um and it, you know, could just be like bodily things, like how do we wear our clothes? What parts of our body do we cover? <clears throat> That's critically important. Um, and in fact, it's a sign of a cohesive society. Mm -hmm. um, having said that, like, like there are things that you know that really are there's really different norms in different societies, and some things that I see as bullying. Mm -hmm. um, if if it happened to me, like I'm, I mentioned the thing about you know making sure my skirt goes fat below mm -hmm. my knees is considered absolutely acceptable in other cultures. And that is just the, the fact of the matter. Um, to be clear, I'm, you know, yeah, I, I guess, I guess you're, you're right though. And that, that is a great example the, the skirt length where um, I might, well, I'm, I'm just thinking, I'm just thinking yeah. time about like whether that would, whether it's, you know, I would consider it inappropriate, mm -hmm. but maybe other people would just say, mm -hmm. no, that's, that's our culture. It's appropriate. Mm -hmm. And so I'm will I'm willing to concede that like, even my definitions of what, what exactly is appropriate or inappropriate might not always fit across cultures. Mm. I mean, it opens a whole different philosophical conversation also about the yeah. limits. Uh, and to me, it also comes down to choice in a different way, you know, whether that person, not in the sense of cancel culture, but even in terms of choice, yeah. does that person have a choice? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it, it don't get me into human rights and all the other <laughs> conversations that this could get us about the hu variations and cultural norms. Um but the cultural norms yeah. are tricky. I mean, yeah. One of the things I will say though, that just to make sure that we don't get lost in, in yeah. the weed, is that there are also universal norms. You know, there mm. are universal norms across countries. And mm. that, that's where like punching up shame, I think like wins the day. You know, when I think about um when I think about South African apartheid and the boycott movement there, um, that was serious international um organized punching up shame that ended up working and and i just want to point out that like 
when the people in power are doing something that's against universal norms of freedom and, and fairness, um, you don't have the opportunity to sue, you know, you you only have a certain number of tools at your disposal. And one of those tools is shame. Mm. Um, so I will just point out that at the extreme end, like appealing to a universal norm, mm -hmm. like freedom yeah. um, and autonomy, which are essentially pretty universal norms, like appealing to such norms um, in a punching up campaign for freedom, like, yeah, that's sometimes the only thing you have at, at your fingertips. The only tool Ukraine, in your right? Ukraine. Yeah, I mean, what? yeah, exactly. Oh, by the way, I I will just say that like when the when the war group broke out in Ukraine, I was like Im very impressed with Zelensky's ability to punch up shame. Mm -hmm. You know, he is is really because of course he had a voice uh and he was he was talking to the world the world leaders uh you know and he was saying hey we're trying to be a democracy here mm -hmm. other democratic world leaders like it is it you know shame on you if you don't help us right now because mm -hmm. this is your battle too mm -hmm. and he just did such a good job of that mm -hmm. he's a really world-class punching up shamer yeah the last thing about punching up yeah it's complicated it it is not consistently but it's important uh, uh, it is also not profitable at all. You never mm -hmm. make money punching mm -hmm. up. Um, uh, you know what I mean? Like it's the opposite in some sense of mm -hmm. the shame machine of mm -hmm. the, you know, the, one way of identifying um, punching up versus punching down, you could argue is just like, how much money is there to make mm -hmm. um, being a human rights activist? Mm -hmm. And the answer is not a lot mm -hmm. at all. Right. Because, because it, it is not a profit center. It is the opposite of a profit center. It's pushing against the status quo. Yeah. Um, so, and it, it's also much longer term uh, commitment and doesn't always work. So, um, yeah. But just like so many other things, it's worthwhile. Like, I mean, just, just to keep punching up the shame. You have yeah. to keep talking about the policies that are being done in your name and, and what is it. So I appreciate um, your scholarship, your time. Uh, we've talked about it throughout the conversation, but is there anything else that you want to say at the end? It's kind of a wrap up of a wider angle of why this matters well I, I would just say the reason i wrote the book now um is that i feel that this shame even though it's everywhere once you name it mm -hmm. it is actually kind of invisible most of the time and it was invisible to me in particular until it wasn't um so i really wanted to i wanted to give people a lens even if i was you know even if i not write about everything mm -hmm. um i wanted people to you know they to argue with me fine if, if they disagree about my definition of appropriate shame and in certain contexts or cultural norms whatever the point i really wanted to make this i want you to recognize when shame is taking the place of persuasive argument when instead of instead of saying like what is true and what can i be persuaded by and you know what bariatric whether whether i should i have bariatric surgery or not will it help with my diabetes risk instead of asking really important helpful informed questions we are just being provoked um and manipulated by a profit center like that's something we should be aware of so and a large part of my efforts here are just to be get people to be self-aware not just of what's happening to them but what they're doing to other people as well absolutely thank you so much um it's such a thought-provoking provocative book the shame machine who profits in the new age of humiliation i appreciate your time um kathy thank you Thanks for having me. And to all of you, stay tuned for more conversations with people from all over the globe. Have a good day. Bye.